Tonight we are in rarefied company as we welcome a group of living legends to celebrate Women's History Month with an inside look at the past, present, and future of women in racing. Their collective experience spans three quarters of a century and bound together by their historical achievements, they stand above the rest. But the trail they blaze is open for all who have come after them. Tonight we will hear how they followed their passion to change the sport of kings forever. This is the Trailblazing Horsewomen Racing Edition. Good evening. Welcome to Stream Horse TV, where horse enthusiasts can join together to expand their horizons in equine sports and culture. We couldn't be more thrilled about gathering these leading ladies together. It is such a special occasion. And we want to thank Starlight and Star Ladies Racing for their support in bringing us this event. We like to start the trailblazing horsewomen by defining the word trailblazer. So it's a pioneer, an innovator, a person who makes a new track through wild country. And we sure have several ladies who fit that description here tonight. We will soon be joined by Jockey Turn TV analyst Donna Brothers, Patty Brown, who you'll remember as Patty Barton, longtime holder of the win record for female jockeys, Diane Crump, first woman to ride in a race and first to ride in the Kentucky Derby, Julie Crone, first woman inducted into the Racing Hall of Fame, and still the winningest female jockey of all time in history. Janet Elliott, who joined Julie in the Hall of Fame as the second woman inducted, legendary steeplechase conditioner who saddled three Eclipse champions and was the leading trainer for six different years. And Joe Motion, a steeplechase vet herself, who can, we're pretty sure claim, is the only person to have had a part in winning both the most prestigious race in the UK, the Grand National, and the most famous race in the US, the Kentucky Derby. So we will see these ladies soon. And later in the program, Taylor Maid will bring us a special conversation for the younger generation looking to get in and stay in the industry, featuring the founders of the Thoroughbred Ladies Cocktail Club. Everyone watching, we're live now. Please comment. Please tell us where you're viewing from. And we can hopefully also get to some viewer questions during the program. Without further ado, I'll bring on our first guests, Donna Brothers, probably the most recognizable name in racing, and you have a special guest with you tonight at home. Well, she's definitely special to me, and I think special to the history of horse racing. And as you said, this is the Trailblazing Horsewomen show, and she was one of the first half dozen women to be licensed as a jockey in the United States. And so you said we're bound together by history. Well, she and I are also bound together by genealogy, so <laughs> I'm glad she yeah. could join us. Yes, absolutely. And I'll bring on Diane, who rode in the same peer group as Patty back during. Yes, absolutely. And I'll bring on Diane, who rode in the same peer group as Patty back during. I'm getting. Yeah, we're hearing the same feedback here, Natalie. Diane, can you hear me? Here, Natalie. Diane, can you, you can see Diane. Diane, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Diane, can you can see Diane. We just have a bit of feedback from somewhere. I can hear you, yes. I'll let you all see. Diane, we just have a bit of feedback from somewhere. Yes. I'll let you all see. Diane, we just have. I just muted. I don't know where it's from. I'll try and bring y'all off and bring on. I just muted. I don't know where it's from. All right, we'll try that again. Hello. Testing, one, two, three, so far so good. And we'll try Diane again. Hello? Hello? I'm still here. One, two, three, so far so good. Yep. 
and we'll try Diane again. Hello? Hello. I don't know where it's coming from. I'm, I'm still here, here waiting. So far, so good. Yeah. Diane, you don't have one more than one monitor on, right? Like a cell phone and a computer monitor? No. Diane, you don't have one more than one monitor on. All right, hold on. I only have one monitor. Let me take Diane out. Are we still getting it, Donna? Testing, one, two, three, four. Don't think we no. are. So, Diane, see if you can get to one window. And meanwhile, she's working on it. Meanwhile, we can talk about <laughs> Patty and being a part of that group who I, I love Diane's biographer always calls it the crop of 1969. Um, and Patty and Diane were part of that very important group, along with Kathy Kustner, who got the licenses and actually started riding races for the first time with the landscape behind them being the civil rights movement, which is fascinating. This is I'm still getting that that feedback. Diane, maybe go out and come back in. But so, Patty, you were part of that group, and and Donna, you were growing up kind of as your mother was making history. So, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll start, and I'll direct questions to my mom, just because um, you know that was my life. I didn't know anything any different than that, and I was really fortunate to have a role model who was so driven by her own passion and by her own determination. And so I, you know, I've often said about my mother, one of the things that I um, really look back on with, with gratitude is that if she ever experienced any sort of a gender bias, she certainly never gave it a name. And so I, I, I always felt like she felt like if somebody wasn't riding her on horses, it's because she either wasn't good enough yet or they didn't know how good she was. And one of those things, one way or another, she would correct it and um, make sure that she rode for them. But mom, I would love for you to talk about, you know, you didn't really have any, the, there were other female riders who had come before you, but only a couple. And so you didn't really have any role model, models in the industry of females that rose to the top like you did. So what did drive you? <laughs> Earning a living to support three, raise three kids. <laughs> that was my major driving force. What do they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, Natalie, another quick story while we try to get Diane on. Uh, you know, my mother was a, um, she was a scrapper. So she would go to the mat with somebody, uh, any of the male jockeys, if she felt like she had been disrespected or taken advantage of in any way. She didn't mind taking it to the mat. And I said to my mom one day about 15 years ago, um, you know, mom, the, the main reason why I think most people don't fight is because they're afraid they might get hurt. Did it ever occur to you that you might get hurt? And she looked at me, paused and said, no, never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's definitely a dangerous sport. And, and I, from what I've read, they, the sport, the big wigs of the sport, were trying to say that safety was one of the reasons that women shouldn't ride. And I love the Eddie Arcaro quote that Mark Traeger unearthed from the New York Times, where he said that when the jockeys asked him for advice, he said, you couldn't really be sure of your manlyhood if you're worried about riding against girls, right? <laughs> that wouldn't worry you, would it? And so that was one of my favorite of, of many quotes um, that Mark had. And Mark really eloquently phrased kind of the way the sport was by saying that it they had basically spent hundreds of years with prejudice masquerading as tradition. And I love that, yeah. that kind of way of describing so it. Just to clarify, this is the book that you're referring to that we. This is the uh, book. Yeah, that he wrote, and it was about Diane Crump. And as you said, he has a whole chapter in there about the crop of 1969, and it wasn't a riding crop; it was the crop of female jockeys who sort of blazed the trail and 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 came up. But you know, when Eddie Orcaro said that prior to that, and around that time, many times the the races had been boycotted. Penny Ann Early, as he points out had been boycotted. Barbara Jo Rubin had been boycotted. The jockeys just refused to ride against him. And, uh, I, you know, one of the things that my mom, I did hear her say, she never complained about gender bias, but I remember hearing her say 
that sometimes as a woman working in a man's environment, the male ego can be tough to under overcome. Now, that was exacerbated by the fact that she was also dealing with the little man's ego, <laughs> which <laughs> I think Mark Traeger does a good job of referring to in the book as well. Absolutely. And um, I, I mean, I can't thank him enough for writing it. He, he did a tremendous job of digging through the archives of the media coverage. Um, and in doing so, he talked about, you know, the mob that I'll show you here shortly, and I'll try and get Diane back on here. But just the the craziness where it was a the front mob page. That I'll show you here shortly. I'll Sorry, Diane, I'm still getting an echo with you. Just the Let's try and mute, and then not mute. Okay. But, so this is Diane. I'm still getting an echo. This is Diane in the first race, right here um, in the middle, and she had to be escorted by a police escort. Uh, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit more later that there wasn't anywhere for jockeys, girl jockeys to get dressed. So she had to go use one of the yes, stewards she, offices. She, was, um, she dressed in the racing secretary's office. And I think yes. Mom, sometimes you were in the first aid room. I was in the steward's office at, at Sunland Park. <laughs> yes. But one of the um, things that Mark talked about, which I found fascinating was also just that, everybody was in a tither and the media included it was like front page news is is this woman or that woman going to ride diane ended up being the one in the first race but patty and the others were right there alongside her and um and it was it even trickled to the next year in the kentucky derby the uh, Derby, the Churchill Downs held a special press conference just around the fact that diane was riding in the race and they asked her you know about attire and um, if she had a love interest. And Mark in the book said, you know, I think if you asked Bill Hartack if he had a love interest, he'd probably bite your head off. But <laughs> well, he'd bite your head off over just about anything. But <laughs> the point was is well taken and that the media would never have considered asking any of the jockeys that were male about, you know, are you married or do you have a love interest? And um, what sort of clothes did you wear to the jocks room today? Nobody would have considered that, but were those questions that you had to field at times? No, no, not, but you didn't ride the Kentucky Derby. I no. guess riding the <laughs> Kentucky Derby makes you a little bit more uh, in line for that sort of questioning. Right. I'm going to try again, Diane. Riding the Kentucky Derby makes you a little bit more in line for that sort of questioning. Right. I'm going to I don't know how. Well, you know who else we want to see who dealt with all this? And Julie Patty, Cohn? Patty, you had, yeah, that's her name. And Patty, you had a record that uh, Patty Cooksey nabbed it for a few days, right? And then <laughs> came Julie. That's right. <laughs> and Julie, I want to hear about how you took your portfolio like a, like a budding, supermodel in New York City or something, you took your portfolio of photos that your dad took, who was a photography teacher, who took of you winning and breezing your own horse and and you jumped over a fence at a racetrack and you got a job. I mean, I how, how does this happen? Well, it gets, it gets, there's two parts, there's two different, there's two really good, able gate, I call them stable gate stories because you can't get a job unless you get in to the stable gate they tell you, go get a job so they can let you in. It's basically like a catch-22. So I was forced, the first time I had my, I had all the stuff you were talking about. I had an envelope and I had my photographs riding at the fair tracks during the summer. I was riding um, thoroughbreds, Appaloosas, quarter horses, and Arabians. I was riding them all. And um, when I left, I was kind of like, uh, I was kind of like, oh my God, I'm going to go to a real racetrack and I want them to know that I can ride. So my dad took all these pictures because he's a wonderful photographer, my father. And I have so many photographs from my life and uh, from, you know, like from my childhood, like riding ponies and stuff. And it's really a special thing to have a dad that's a photographer. Yeah, and stuff like that. Like he'd be like, do that again. And I'd be like, my pleasure. Um, and that's my mom. My mom was really, really important in my life. And in fact... When I went to Churchill Downs, 
the very first time with my mother, uh, they you're not allowed to work unless you're 16 years old. Um, so my mom went to the new grocery store and changed my birth certificate from July to April. And it was right before the Derby. Um, and so I came into Churchill Downs as a 15 year old and my mom went with me and we both got hot walking jobs at Clarence Picou's barn. And, and it was funny when she changed my birth certificate date because she was around and she's like, well, I'm your mother. I can, I can say when you were born. <laughs> uh, and so, but then we were, then we, then the next year I just let it go back to my proper date. You know what I mean? But I had had that, that license from Churchill Downs. I just lost it like last year when we moved. But it was really fun because my birth date's wrong on the thing. It was kind of funny. So then the next stable gate I get to. So that stable gate, my mom and I walked in and she forced my birth certificate. Birth certificate. Then we went to uh, walking around. We both got hot walking jobs. And that was like really cool. Um, and then um, that was a spectacular, spectacular bid derby, by the way. Um, Kentucky oh, derby. wow. Yeah. And I actually, I got to walk Golden Act which was kind of cool. I got to hot walk him a little bit. So it was kind of a fun thing to be in the Derby barn. And stuff. So then my next stable gate story was when you just mentioned was I had the pictures from riding at the fair tracks and I'm like, they won't let me in the stable gate. They're like, no, you can't come in the stable gate because you don't have a job and a license. And I said, well, how do I get a license if I don't get in to get a job? They walk around and see people. And they were like, nope, you can't get in. And so my mom drove away but I got out of the car and then I just ran down the edge of the fence and went over like behind the barns and climbed the fence and then I walked down the road and in two minutes a lady drove up in a car and said what are you doing and I said well my name is Julie Crown and here's my pictures I'm a jockey well oh, I'm gonna be a jockey I want to be a jockey um and uh I'm looking for a job I know how to walk hot so I've been riding and she goes well my husband helps one person every year and this year it's gonna be a female jockey she said so the Jerry Pace had taken female, he had taken an apprentice job every year and he helps them break their maiden and get them, get them started and teaches them how to ride and stuff. And so that's what I, that's, that's the barn I landed in after I climbed the fence, which was pretty good. <laughs> and then did, <laughs> did you all feel like the doors had been blown open by this crop of 1969 and the, the women who came before you when Donna, when you and Julie became jockeys was the respect earned or was it felt immediately well julie started before me and i'd love to hear her take on that because it was a lot different for me because by the time i started in 1987 i was fortunate in that you know here's julie just trying to get onto the backside of a racetrack i was raised on the backside of a racetrack so i already i mean my first license i was probably nine years old and i was a hot walker and and so i, I kind of grew up back there so that wasn't ever a problem for me and it was easy for me to open doors because if it was somebody who I hadn't met, they probably knew my mother or my brother or my sister. So Julie, talk about how it was for you because you didn't have anybody in the industry that you could say, oh yeah, you knew my mom or you knew yeah. my dad. So exactly. how was that's, that? That's really true. That's Now that you said that, I was kind of like, whoa. And even now there's people that call me and say, like, how do you get to the backside? What do I do? Like, how do I start? That's one thing with <laughs> Frankie, Frankie Lovato's jockey school thing that he started, like he has the DVD that talks about how to do things. Like that might be the first and only thing that people are helping young jockeys to get started, you know? So let's see, so I was, I think when you were saying that, when you were asking that question, it was interesting in my mind, because right away I was like thinking, well, I don't think that people get any respect now. Like, <laughs> because I think there's like a, there's a suspended place that it seems like even though like a jockey, like Patty, Donna's mom could do stuff for us and like Kathy Custer and those guys because they were the very first ones and Diana, they can help in a way where you could tap into some energy where you could say, well, they did it, you know, so I can do it. So I think there was more for me of being tapped into the energy, knowing that they came before me and knowing that they had some, you know, the same adversities and they had the same, uh, you know, and even worse, like, you know, they would be talking and they'd be like, oh, I dressed in the in the first aid room, you know, and you're like, oh, did you any Christmas? Um, and I think there's phases of it, and I'm not sure if they ever really completely go away. Like, it seems like if you do something wrong as a girl jockey, the first thing everybody would say was, oh, that happened because she's a girl jockey. 
not because you're just making you know, it, you know? Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of um, prejudice still. And I, and I'm, I'm sure that it's really kind of interesting for me because I like to watch like the amount of female jockeys that are in the, like in 1969, it was a big group. I think when Donna and I were riding in the 80s, that was the hugest group of female riders I've ever, like, kind of what racetrack I would go to, you'd see tons of girl jockeys everywhere. And then they all kind of, like, just went away a little bit. And then they kind of came back down. There's, like, about seven girl apprentices. And it's really fun to watch them win the races. But for me, when you were asking the questions, I was like, mm, I think there's pretty much, like, it's still, it's still that way a little bit. I think your things are held against you if you made mistakes, and they'll say that you're a girl. But, um... I don't, I, don't, I don't know, maybe it's getting a little better, but I still think it's around some, you know? Well, you you had a, you were on horses, you know, since you could practically walk, right? So, you know, you clearly had an edge and I'd love to hear more and we love to bring it back to the horses here. I'd love to hear more about the communication and just what you discovered that gave you an edge with, with how to how to get your horses to respond. Wait, before you answer that, let, let, remember this book, Ride to Win, with uh, Bob Portis and Gary West. And one of the things I love about this is in this book, you sort of categorize it. You say horses fall into one of four different personality <laughs> types, and they can be a combination of those. And you narrowed it down to playful, warrior, claustrophobic, and needy. And um, so how did you discover that? Was that something you learned about horses before you ever got to the racetrack or did you get to the racetrack and you worked around these horses? And then how did you say, you know what, basically there's four different types. How did all that happen? Yeah, that's kind of fun. Cause well, first of all, the one photograph where my mother was, I had the pony and the dog was doing a trick and then the, mm -hmm. pony, right, and then the, the horse had her leg up on my, uh, yes, stuff like that. Well, I was allowed, well, I was like forced to do circus tricks with horses when I was a kid. Like my mom made me teach my horses how to lay down, how to sit, how to follow me at liberty, like with nothing on their heads, like no bridle and stuff like that. And so I went into, like when I was, like what Donna just said, I was nine years old, little tiny kid. My mom would get a client's horse and the horse would come into the, so here's how it starts with the relationship and figuring all that stuff out. The horse would be, Standing in the stall, and my job is to get the horse to turn and face and look at me and put its ears up. Like, so I have to do something. And then I also would try to get them, like, to do things like just pick up one leg. So you tap their leg, and they pick it up, and then you pet them. And, and, and then you go to tap their leg. And before you even go to tap their leg, most of the time, they'll just pick it up, and then you pet them. So just by spending my whole entire young childhood of realizing like, like or learning and, and teaching horses like to tap them or ask them something and then to wait for their response and then it, and then the response gets faster and faster and then pretty soon it's almost like they're reading your mind and you kind of just go like hey i would like you to pick up your leg you know and then because of all the other stuff and the reward and the timing the horse is kneeling and bowing and laying down and but it was always a series of asking rewarding with a little bit of a give or like um you know like like donna was mentioning like i i, I labeled the horses as needy and then like whatever the things were and then cat and then the categories have specific things that those horses need so like the needy horse you know might, might want to stay with the pony and not warm up too much you know and then the playful horse um oh my god i've been on rubiana was a great sprinter i rode um he was an eclipse award sprinter and I would ride him and he would be bucking and squealing in the post parade and stuff, you know? And if I took any of that away from him, like if I was like, no, hey, you know, don't, don't be so happy before you race. He would, race <laughs> he would race slower. So like you have to let the horse have their personality and let them express themselves enough to where it makes them, like it almost makes them stronger and faster. Like you tap into their, their energy that, that is their, their plus sign. And then, and so that was really fun too. And there was, um, one time there was a really big compliment. I rode two horses in one night and one of the trainers said to me, I, of course, because you need to really stay busy and, and get him going and get his energy up and make him pay attention. And like, you're so full of it, like a horse for you. And, and then later on in the evening, 
I had a guy that was like, oh, she's so nervous and I love how quiet you are on her and you don't, like, you don't use the whip on her and you're just so gentle and you, you don't care if she's prancy and all crazy and stuff. So having two trainers in one night say that I was two different riders was kind of, <laughs> I was like, well, that's a big compliment to be two things at once. But mostly it was, it's just a series of give and take and accommodating the horse's personality. Like, um, that, you know, you guys have been around when, when people are like, don't stand that horse still, don't stand that horse still. You know, like everybody kind of knows horses have a little bit of personality traits, you know, like you kind of can say like, what kind of a personality? And they'll be like, oh, he's going to shy from everything. Be careful, you know, or something like that. So, but it was just always a series of little tiny indications and asking a request to the horse and then rewarding them and timing like the timing of, of a reward for a horse means so much to the horse like you know like it's kind of a silent thing and people probably might it's almost like if you're holding someone and they were to squeeze your hand you know you could feel the intimacy of that and how much it doesn't even take that much so like even squeezing your hands hard tells the horse something different than squeezing the reins with soft fist. You know, and the horse well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt just because I think some of the people watching are going to want to like go, how do I apply this to my horse? And there's a great example in the book where you taught the horse that you were on in the post parade what the riding crop was for. And so you took it away from the pony and you smooched to him and he didn't respond. So you whack him with the riding crop on his shoulder. It obviously didn't hurt him, but he jumps forward and you're like, good boy, good boy. Like pet yeah. him. And then the chirp. next time you got to chirp first, you got to go. And then, right. I said that. Yeah. <laughs> that you smooched to him and he didn't respond. Yeah. So you whack him. <laughs> and so she taught him in just, you know, that five minutes, like when I smooch to you, if you jump forward, I'm not going to whack you with this riding crop. Right. And right. so it just teaches them. And, and I thought that that was a really, uh, you know, I had never thought about that before until I read it. In four well, minutes. and this, this group is, is known for being excellent horsewomen. And I think when we get Janet on, she'll have something to say also about her technique and getting the horses to stride between the fences um, and, and Joe galloped horses forever. And I'm going to try Diane again here and I'd love for it to work. Diane. I think it's working now, maybe. <laughs> Hi, Diane, tell us about the mob that you encountered on your way to your the first race. <laughs> Well, you know what? I don't, I really ignore stuff like that. So <laughs> they all gathered around there to get, me, to get me to the paddock, but I really didn't pay any attention to them. My mind was thinking, this is finally really going to happen. So really, that's all I cared about. So the rest of it was immaterial. <laughs> well, and the Derby press conference they held for you solo was um, a testament to your maturity at such a young age and by all accounts, you you answered the questions like an old pro, even though you were brand new. Um, and I think Julie and Diane can probably both attest to, I think, the fact that the Derby is just different, even though, you know, they say in the Super Bowl or the Derby, you play it, you ride it, like you do it like every other game, every other race, right? But not really. Well, no, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. If you're around racing, it's something that, I mean, it's, you know, it's the Super Bowl of horse racing, but there's a feel that's there that isn't anywhere else. So, I mean, I think you have to, you know, yes, the race is the same in a way as riding any other race, except cut the leading up to it and what you know is in your heart and your mind that, you know, of everything, of how important it is and what it means. So you have that aspect, but... You know, once the gates open, then it's another race because you got to think about what you're doing and how to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Quickly. And yeah. then what do you, what do you all um, think just then and now with the jocks room and its evolution? I mean, you started that first race, Diane, you were in the one of the secretary's offices. Well, I was in the HBBA office for the <laughs> right. first race. But to me, this was... I found this very cool. So when I first started riding, you know, I was in the, a lot of, well, the HPBA room at Hialeah, but a lot of times I was in a ladies restroom. Mm -hmm. So I went to, when I, I grew up around, it was Sunshine Park in those days, then Florida Downs and Tampa Bay Downs. That's where I, that's where that was my home. So I went there and I rode there in the winters early on. And 
I used a ladies' restroom, and then they put a little tiny trailer that maybe held two or three people. It was that small. <laughs> and so the cool thing is, when I came back 30 years later, it was equal. The mm. box room at Tampa Bay Downs was 50-50, 50 percent men, 50 percent women, and it was just as the women's part was just as nice. And I thought this was really cool because the girls that were riding there then were kids from the people that I, you know, riders or trainers or whatever that I knew when I first came around as a kid. So I thought that was kind of a cool way to, to be able to end it, end my career. To see awesome. the huge difference of mm -hmm. ladies restrooms, first aid rooms. That was a popular thing that we were in a first aid room for years before they started, you know, making women's jocks rooms. Yes. I mean, and after reading I biography, that biography, that evolution, I thought that was yeah. really cool. But so Julie, then you encountered, you were, you were winning, you were like winning titles at tracks that didn't have a room for you, right? Yeah, that's crazy. You said that because, well, it was, it was like Diana just said though, they tried to make a jockey's room, but what, what they would often do is they would put the girls like, Way in the back, like, oh my gosh, at Bowie Racetrack, I used to have to run like an eighth of a mile to the trailer that was in the, the that I was accommodated with, you know, but to get to the jockey's room in order to like, like weigh in and ride my race and stuff. So then I went out, I went to Mammoth Park and I'm, I'm, I'm fashioning myself to be like, have a pretty good meet. And I, uh, I'm, I'm on, I'm sorry about that. I'm on the, I'm, in the back room, and it, once again, the same the same exact thing is happening. I can't get to the jockey's room in time. I can't get to the jockey's room in time in order to wash my face and change and stuff in between. So what we did is we made like an in between room, and I and I know this is kind of weird, but if I have to go to the bathroom in between, I would just go behind the. I had a curtain set up, you know, with like all my jockey stuff, and I would just pee in a cup and throw it in the toilet. Like the, because I had no choice. I had to ride back-to-back -back races. There was no bathroom that was near enough for me to use. Like, I had no choice. Literally, no choice. And so then what they did the next year was they put a little commode and a sink and stuff in that little room. But still to this day, the girl job in the back and then the main room and the little tiny room in the front is what they share and what they use if they ride back-to-back -back races because they can't get back to their thing. And Santa Anita, same exact thing. I rode the car at Santa Anita and they would want me to run through the paddock past, you know, 12 wild thoroughbreds jumping around with this much room <laughs> to go um, back to the girls' job room to get, like, to myself. So they moved the female quarters into the Santa Anita room and they kind of switched it around. And by then I had been in a couple of jocks rooms that they tried to build fast or they put, they're filled with pink tile. Oh, <laughs> I'm so tired of looking at pink girls' jocks rooms. Um, so anyway, we, we, t I told them, don't go fast, take your time, like do white and yellow, like don't do pink. And we were joking around and stuff. Um, I but see like a, a segment coming up, Donna, for you to follow Julie around to check out the new digs at the, who's done the tile and who hasn't and like, put, every, put everybody to the task. Churchill, that's <laughs> the incredible girls jocks room I've ever seen. It's like the best. Which one? Churchill. Oh, absolutely. Okay. They did the Shout best. Out. <laughs> Shout out to Churchill. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been wanting to get here. Um, Julie was joined in 2009 by none other than Janet Elliott, who we have here, who galloped her own horses, and Joe Motion, who also galloped horses forever. So we want to welcome you two special ladies to the group. And I would love to use that Hall of Fame segue to say that Joe, your son Graham, was just named as a finalist for the Hall of Fame this year. And how do you feel about that? Oh, it's, it's very exciting. It, it's funny, really, because I've often said to myself, I hope I live long enough that he might get considered for the Hall of Fame. Oh. I've often thought about really when it comes around every year when they come up with it. And I think, well, maybe down the road he'll be nominated. And I hope I live long enough. <laughs> well, we now, I know after 
knowing you a little better, where he gets it from. I'd love to hear how you got your start and about your big Grand National experience. Well, the Grand National thing in England was steeplechasing, chasing and over here, it was all flat racing. I mean, in, in England, I, my, my father was lost at sea during the war. Mother was left with three girls in private boarding school. And I said, and I was the youngest of three. And um, I basically said, this is a waste of time. And I took myself out. I was already riding out at a steeplechase yard in, in, the, in the town. And um, I think I started when I was about 14. And uh, so I left school and went to work in the steeplechase yard there and was there for some years. And that's when I did nickel coin all the time. Um, she and came was, it, um, was your title stable lad? Is that correct? Well, everybody was a stable lad in England, you know? I mean, the head, the, the one that's never used here is head lad, the, the, the foreman, if you like, or the barn manager is, is the head lad. And I was Jack O'Donoghue's head lad for several years. And then I decided that really, honestly, horses were consuming my life. And I was way too tall and heavy to be a jockey at all, which I'd have loved to have done. And um, basically came to this country to get away from horses, try and change a new track. I went to Canada, actually, and got myself a job and somewhere to live. And then I was offered to an uncle. Uh, who knew an owner had horses with the Adams, Dooley Adams, mother and father, was training then. And um, they, through my, I don't know, they must have heard what I'd been up to, and um, they offered me the job as assistant trainer down here. So I leapt at it. I was, you know. So here's Dooley Adams. Here's uh, we Dooley also have Eleanor Summers. A lot. Um, and so Joe's the first horse Joe rode in the U.S. when she got here was a horse owned by Eleanor Sears, who happens to be in the Tennis Hall of Fame. And she was a big advocate for Title IX and female athletes everywhere. And so I think it's no coincidence that you encountered her. No, well, it was it was lucky, really. I, I, I can see the cobblers in the horses golfs down in Southern Pines, because in those days there was no racing in New York in the winter at all. And everybody went to Camden, Southern Pines, Aiken, or further down. And um, Miss Sears was, was great at pushing anybody that she felt was um, breaking into a man's world. I mean, she would have loved the fact when women started racing, but she was long gone by then. Because I'm talking about the 50s. I'm, I, I, was, um, I came here in 52, and um, there were only four of us girls galloping back stretch. Mickey Walsh's two daughters and a girl called this runch who was galloping for Tom Waller um, and myself. And uh, so those were kind of fun days, you know, but I never aspired to be a jockey because I was five foot ten at that time. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway. Right, and here we have Nickel Coin. So this is, this is Nickel Coin at home with me on her, yes. And then this is in the unsaddling enclosure for the National when she's standing here steaming away. And the other thing is, this is an animal called a mare called Gamelle who came from France. And she pulled like she had run away with me at the trot. And so we used to try and keep her off the track at Belmont. And um, it was a big parking lot in the back of the track, now right across the other side of the track. And um, I used to try and exercise her around there, trotting away and trying to get her fit. And of course, I missed the, in England, we were up and down until North Downs and things. So you could get a horse fitter quicker than you can on a flat race track. And all you Saratoga goers, this is the Oklahoma training track right here. Yes. Yeah. And um, where you were around the great Nashua diaper. Uh, 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 Sonny Jim, of course it was Mr. Switch Simmons in those days, but he his barn was right by the Oklahoma track as you walked through back through to the mostly steeplechase yard at the back of uh, Oklahoma there. And um, he used to, I, I'd, I'd be walking backwards and forwards and he was very nice to us girls. He was very pleasant. He was one of the few that, I don't know that he employed any girls, but I think that he had tolerated us. But anyway, and I remember clearly hanging over the rail, watching natural work. And uh, he, he was he was such a good looking horse. and. Uh, of course, that was his time, you know, and it, it was great fun. And, and Mr. Fitzsimmons was really, really nice and, you know, welcoming to sort of back, backstretch scene, if you like. 
I want to just make sure everybody saw the, the headgear here. Oh, yes, I wondered if you noticed the headscarves. That was long before helmets. And the only time I wore my hunt hat was when it rains, to keep my head dry. <laughs> so it was just a rain cover back then. <laughs> It well, didn't have a harness on anyway, so. Yes. Well, I'd love to just add that Nickel Coin, the mayor that Joe walked up when she won the Grand National, is still to this day the last mayor to have won the Grand National. Mm. And Joe, to her knowledge, is the first last to have walked up the Grand National. I, I, I have to say that it was, um, um, what I was going to say, but... It, it, it was very special to have, I did her all her racing life. She was actually in training for about four years. She came, it's a long story, I'm not, not gonna get into it, but she came to the the owners as a, as a point to point ride for his son who just came out of the army and they wanted it. It was no part of a rider. And uh, so she came to the yard and I think because I was the newcomer in the yard and the youngest anyway, I, sort of got stuck doing with Mayor Nickel Coin, who came into the yard. Well, I had the last laugh because she turned out to be the best, best thing that they ever that they and had. And a really clever jumper, right? Having been a show jumper. She, she was a very clever jumper, yes. She very clever jumper. This is how she got round no, entry, I think. But anyway, I, I'm a very clever jumper. And, that, and not the fastest thing in the world. That was the thing. But it, the Grand National is not speed that always wins it anyway. Well, I think that this is a perfect segue for you, Janet. And Donna, this has come up in prior conversations that we've had. Sometimes it's the women who really have the upper hand at getting into a horse's head. And I think, Janet, you've demonstrated by your resume on paper, but tell us a little bit about nurturing those horses along that, that maybe nobody else has the patience for. Well, I have the benefit of being able to ride. And I rode you know, all my horses uh, and, and went out with the, you know, the sets. And generally I led the set so that I could, you know, set the pace and, and uh, make sure everybody did what I wanted them to do. So they had to stay behind me. But um, now I think, as you were saying, and Julie was saying, you, you get sort of into a horse's head by you know, working with them and, and if they're nervous, you know, I think women have a, a calmer way of, of dealing with that. First of all, I think because we're not as strong as the men, we have to learn to finesse them and, you know, get them to respond to the way we are thinking. Do you have any favorites? Um, I know that I read once about Declare Your Wish being being a tough one. Say that again? Declare Your Wish or any other favorites? Oh, oh well, Declare Your Wish, he was fairly temperamental. Uh, and we actually, he lived in the field most of the time because if he was in the stall, he was not, he was not happy and, and he would wheel and dump you and you know, do silly things, but he was, you know, he liked being out and he was turned out with, you know, several other horses, um, just came in, you know, to get fed or ridden. Uh, but uh, now there, that's, that's a good horse right there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now Campanile and there's Maggie Neary, that was a filly. But uh, no, Flat Top was actually had some some uh, issues. He was a very very bad stall walker, and didn't you know like to be enclosed at all. But my barn in Pennsylvania, I had a wonderful stall that looked out over the yard on one side, and then bars between all the stalls. So there was another horse behind him and another horse beside him, and then he had a door in the front. So. He really liked that stall, and that made a huge difference to him. But when we traveled with him, I remember we took him to Nashville to run in a race out there. He went out. Actually, I think we brought him down to Camden first in the, in the horse van. He did all his work at home first, and then he got on the horse van in the box stall, came to Camden, and then he lived in the horse van. 
it was <laughs> left it wide open, you know, opened up all that was a big, a big one of those big, huge ones. And uh, he just lived in there and, and he he was happy and they did. He said, I don't want to go in any stalls. Thank you. And so and, how, uh, how did it feel for both of you, Julie, as well? So Jonathan Shepard, I just found this little factoid that by watching the, the videotapes of your speeches, each of you, your inductions, Jonathan Shepard inducted both of you. What kind of role as as a leading gentleman figure did he have? I mean, I know I know Janet worked for him forever, but but can can Janet you go first and tell us about him? Who, oh, Julie? Are you going first? You go first. <laughs> well, I came to work from sort of by accident, really. I was uh, babysitting the children. Of that, of his son Daniel, and um, but you know, I'd been working with horses. I was a groom for the Irish show jumping team, and when I came, well, I didn't get to go to Mexico to the Olympics as a groom, but ended up coming up to America and ended up working for Jonathan. But it all kind of happened by mistake, really. My whole life has happened by mistake, but it's all been good luck. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was just, it was hard work, but I loved it. And, and I really enjoyed the animals and, and I enjoyed the way he worked with horses. He had a, a second sense yes. about all horses. Somehow he just, he, he that was just him. He had an amazing sense of, of what a horse would be good at or what it wouldn't be good at. and and different ways, even with leg issues, you know, he was very uh, attentive to their soundness and their legs. And I learned all that from him. And Julie? Uh, it, I sometimes get like a little bit where I can start to feel about I can start what thinking. You know, but he was a the most we can't work where you're cutting out julie but i think i get i think i get the program yeah. i want to shift quickly to donna before donna donna and patty head out donna you decided to retire and and you went into as everyone knows and they see you often you went into covering the races often on horseback um can you just tell everyone about that and and how it's been. I mean, you you now are front row to lots of great moments, um, and I'll get to that one <laughs> times in a second. But yeah, I mean, I have to say it's really been a blessing. When I retired from riding, I retired to marry Frank Brothers and live happily ever after, and that has happened. Um, so we've been married 23 years, but I just sort of got in lucky, got into the TV stuff. Uh, NBC needed a reporter on horseback just about the time I started to get into it. And yeah, it's been uh, incredible, right? Like what a huge blessing for all of us who just love the horses and love horse racing to be able to be right there when those magical moments happen on the racetrack. And for, for everybody who's been a jockey or a horse trainer or competitive in any way, we all know that you're not friends with all the guys in the jocks room. You're friends with some of them and you like a lot of them, but there's some of them you don't like at all. And I can tell you that when they, even those ones, when they win a race and you're so close to that aura of energy that they have, that is just an energy of gratitude and just, you know, such joy that you're immediately happy for them, no matter how you've ever added, felt about them. You added a lot of joy to my Breeders' Cup by you. It, <laughs> like, sometimes I watch the racing just to watch your interview. I love that. <laughs> But Leah, when you get to interview me after the Breeders' Cup, Donna, that was such a special moment. Oh, my God. It was a special moment for me, too, Julie, yeah. because you were the first female rider to win a Breeders' Cup. And a quick story, I was second. Well, let me back up. In 1995, Julie was second, got beat this far by Mr. Greeley in the sprint. And the horse was 20 to 1, should not have run that well. And she came back, and she was disappointed. And I said, Julie, you should be happy. That horse ran a great race. And she said, well, I'm not happy. So I run second a few races later in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile on Hennessy, and I get beat this far. And I was like, also like 12 to one, not expected to win. As soon as I walked back into the girls' jocks room, Julie said, so are you happy? <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> Touche. I was not happy. <laughs> so that was special to be there with Julie for that. It was special for both of us. And thank you for saying that. But yeah, I've been blessed. Natalie, are you still there? Oh, I'm here. There we go. I, Donna, you had you had watched your first derby. I think they don't let you do this anymore, but you were up on the roof of the backside on the rooftop of a barn, right? For winning colors. And uh, I loved the way you wrote in your book about that story, but, um, and I, I'm sure there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And it's just interesting though, that you had, that was your first derby and, and you've had so many incredible vantage points since then. Um, the one that sticks out to me, I was so struck by the feeling you had that you wrote about in the New York Times, the moment that American Pharaoh won the Triple Crown was just for anyone who's been waiting. You know, everybody's been waiting. And, and for me, I'd waited like, you know, my a lifetime. But, yeah. but you said afterward that you kind of, you had to be in the zone. So that like insane moment, you had to kind of have it afterward. Tell us about that. I was very struck by your 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 takeaways from that? Well, I had a friend who asked me, you know, how'd you feel about it? And I thought, yeah, how did I feel about it? Like, I've seen other people write about it. And I felt like they were like sort of hollow in the way they wrote about it, because it didn't feel emotional. So I sat down and I started to think, how did I feel about it? And I get choked up every time I tell this story. I had talked to my brother and my sister both that night, and they had watched that triple crown separately, my brother in Montana, my sister in Kentucky. And they both watched it alone in their living room. And they both said they just burst into tears. Like, I think a lot of us did, right? When American Pharaoh did it, we had waited 37 years and it finally happened. And so I couldn't do that. Like, I just had to keep it together. I wanted to burst into tears, but I needed to talk to Victor Espinosa. And so when I started to think about how did I feel, I thought, I felt robbed. <laughs> That's what I felt. I didn't get to have that emotional like moment. But the next morning when I, I stayed that night at the Garden City Hotel and the next morning I got out of the shower and I, it hit me and I went, oh my God, it happened. And I just started crying right then when I got out of the shower. So I felt like I had the moment. I just felt like I got robbed of having that emotional sort of, um, you know, chance to let go. But I wouldn't I still wouldn't trade places with anybody. <laughs> It's just, it was a special seat you had, but it, it was a guttural roar from, from within that was heard on the highway, um, I read afterward, and, and spilled out over into people driving down the highway. And, um, and Natalie, you were there, right? Live? I was there live, and um, my grandfather was still alive back in Louisville, and I think I told you this, he gave some sage advice. That he We were out, you know, celebrating by the paddock afterward, and everyone's just elated, and I'm like, oh, were you excited? He was my first call. I was, but it's over now. So, <laughs> so it's done now. And I was like, well, you've seen 12 triple crowns in your life. <laughs> like, seriously. Yeah. But it was, yeah. it was so, um, the sound was in, insane. And a, a lot of like the mainstream media kind of talked about it afterward. Like the roar was like this, like, not of this world guttural release that everyone had been holding for so long. Um, and, and I was just, you know, like I told you before, Donna, I wrote everything down after that day. I, I wrote all my feelings on paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but, a good yeah. thing. You don't want to let go of that. Yeah, for sure. It's something you want to hang on to. And, um, and, you know, memory kind of turns mythical, I guess, after a while, um, these ladies can probably, attest to that but so bringing it to the to the new up-and-comers we have a special presentation from the founders of the thoroughbred ladies cocktail club i want to wish donna and patty happy trails so they can get on their way and if everyone else would stand good to by. talk to you all bye guys yes. thank you bye. So much. all right such Maybe a pleasure just... so we will bring you this presentation and i'd love to get everyone's thoughts afterward Um, my name is Carrie Brogdon, and I currently run with my husband and my mother, Mockmer Hall Thoroughbreds, our horse farm, and Mockmer Hall sales. 
And I'm Katie Taylor of Taylor Made Sales. We founded Thoroughbred Ladies Cocktail Club to bring women all throughout the horses industry together um, in a place with no pressure, no rules, no agenda, where we can really be ourselves. The Thoroughbred Lady Co Ladies Cocktail Club is basically for any female that is interested in either coming into the thoroughbred industry or currently in the thoroughbred industry. And obviously it's very, very important for us to get the mentors there also. I am the only girl in my family business. I work with my dad, my brother, my three uncles, two boy cousins, and two adopted boy cousins and their dad. Backstory of the Thoroughbred Ladies Cocktail is I always, I, I, in my company with my family, I'm surrounded by all these very talented, very passionate men that built tailoring from a pickup truck and a pitchfork mm -hmm. to the leading consigner in the world. So it's, that's intimidating. But, you know, I, I never found anybody that looked like me. So Carrie was like my hero. Like I used to say that to my dad all the time. I was like, I want to be just like Carrie Brog did. I just grew up in this family with all stay at home moms that waited on their sons and husbands hand and foot. Like I remember my mom being like this one time I had a, a boyfriend over to dinner. She's like, aren't you gonna make his plate? And I was like, he's got two hands. Like, <laughs> Nope. <laughs> and that so, would not happen in my no. family. So I always just felt this like wrongness about me. Like, you know, just, I'm not quite right. I'm not quite a good enough mom. I'm not quite a good enough wife. I'm not quite a good enough at what I'm doing at work. It took me a really long time to get here, but it's just like, I just, I'm best when I'm being myself. People used to always, when I first started at my own consignment, uh, gosh, I guess that's about 16, 17 years ago now. Uh, you get this thing, well, Carrie's so hard to work for. I used to have unbelievable guilt. It would keep me up at night. I'd be like, oh my, I can't believe people feel this way about me and blah, blah, blah. And now I'll fast forward to where I am now. And I hear Carrie's really hard to work for. And I say, damn straight. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, then you're not going to make it to the top. I'm so passionate what, about what I do and I do a great job and I get called things like abrasive or, or bitchy or I be, I need, I'm told to underreact. I, my dad tells me that all the time, which is not something what to say. What the hell would he tell me? Not something to say to somebody who's overreacting. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. Never in the history, yeah. somebody I saw that Facebook, never in the history of anyone saying calm down to woman yeah. as a woman calm down yeah. <laughs> in a life spent in the thoroughbred industry i've always felt this need for there to be women at the top you know who do you aspire to be like and 20 years ago there was we were very few and far between but now you know we're coming and we're, we're so many more of us are getting to where we want to be that joining together we can just help you know, uh, our former selves when we were little and young and there wasn't anybody to look to. Because when you're young in this industry, you get a lot of mixed signals and a lot of, you know, of what, what you're supposed to act like and what you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it's like, if you work hard and you're truly yourself and you follow your passion, you're going to get a lot further. Every year I've taken a mentor, mentee on and I kept telling him, think like a man, act like a man, think like a man, act like mm -hmm. a man. And I realized that ultimately why? Yeah. Why? Why? I'm an emotional being. Mm -hmm. I'm Katie's not as over the top emotion <laughs> as I am, but I'm an emotional being. That's why I want to be in this industry. Mm -hmm. I love the horses. All these women that are at the top, whether it's Meg Levy or, or Debbie Spike Pierce, or, you know, that, that, that there's a reason why they're there. They're special. Mm -hmm. They're special. They're strong, but they're still mothers and wives mm -hmm. and, and compassionate women. They have so much strength in their convictions and they have this, uh, you know, ceaseless passion for what they're doing that they don't give up. I think the more the we women that are at the top develop our relationships together, we're going to be able to help a lot more young women come up the pipeline. Mm -hmm. But only the strong will survive. I would say for every woman that's coming into this industry, or if you're just starting already, you've probably noticed that there are some gender dynamics that are maybe not where they should be. And it's not something that should deter your passion. There's a lot of things that you can do to mitigate um, sexual harassment and other gender issues and to build yourself up and stay on the track that you want to be on and not let these certain issues or people tear you down. Every time I speak about it and they're a bunch of young women, I always tell them the most important thing they're going to have to learn how to do is the Heisman. 
And I literally mean beehive me. I have seen several of the girls I mentored not survive because the harassment. And um, I would just tell, I kept telling them, I said, don't let them get to you. Just put your hand up, say, no, this is not appropriate. We're, we work together and that is it. And I think that's a very hard thing for a lot of young women to do because they want to be friends with everyone. How do you have the most successful participation in it that you can, given the dynamics of that you're in a, in a very male dominated workforce mm -hmm. and you want to have success with these men and be friends. We just want to help the women that are coming up in this industry they're going to have some of those experiences that I definitely had when I was younger. And uh, I just, I guess want to them to be more prepared mm -hmm. that those kind of challenges are going to come up and not to be afraid to stand up for themselves mm -hmm. and say, Nope, that's not what we're going to do. You just have to, you know, be in an environment where you can work as hard as you possibly can and, and have the respect of your peers for being a hard worker. So for those of you ladies out there who are interested in joining us in the thoroughbred industry or the horse industry, the things I'd say to you is to try everything. Um, you never know until you try and commit to doing things for a season. Once you get beyond that base level of experience, the sky's the limit. I mean, there I, I hear that all the time. I never knew this was an option. It's just unbelievable all the op opportunities that are out there now. You can work in an office. You can book mayors. You can, mm -hmm. you know, be an sell, event planner. Be an event can... planner. You can be a vet. You can sell stallion mm -hmm. season. If you're willing to show up and be your best self yeah. and and work harder than anybody else, I'll do whatever I can to to help you get your goals achieved. And Carrie will too. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's about raising each other up mm -hmm. and not being. I think a lot of times women are their own harshest critics. And I think that that's a big part of the dynamic that's changing because you're not going to be a critic of one of your best friends. No. In getting us all out of our silos and our own camps, it just, yeah, it elevates us all because then you get to know one another and you can build one another up when we all elevate together. A long time ago when there was just a smattering of women in the horse industry and the barriers were so steep and hard to get in, those women, I, I really admire them a lot because they didn't have anybody that they could turn and say, you know. Hey. I definitely feel that they yeah. were more guarded also. Yeah, um, they were. They had to be just stone face killers. <laughs> they, they did. They did. So we're trying to just make it a safe place to be who you are and to be recognized for who you are and celebrated for who you are and empowered to go out and be yourself and change the industry. But, but at the same point, you better be a hard ass worker. Yeah. <laughs> No lazy. No lazy. <laughs> <laughs>
you have to get your horsemanship in order. Like, I, I even was a champion jockey and left, and I still do stuff that has to do with learning about horses, like, every day almost, you know? Um, still to this day, I'll, I'll learn things about horses. Um, and I think that it was really inspirational, and they were fun. They, they, I, could, I could see that they could really be a lot of fun, too. But a um, great idea, too, to support everybody and to lift each other up and stuff. And um, those, are, those are really positive, good messages. And they're very frank and honest, I feel like. Diane, what did you think? Real straight talk, yep. For me, whatever you think, you know, whatever you're, is in your heart, you love it, you work straight ahead. You look, you're looking at your goals. And me, I don't let anything change that. I don't let anything stop it. So I continue on with exactly what I want to do. And I don't care what it is, and I don't care what anybody thinks. So I don't think in the same way as far as like, you know, men having more opportunities or having more say in things. For me, it's just like you work toward your goal and you don't pay attention to the rest of it. And I never have. I've always done what I felt was I should do, what it was in my heart. And so I didn't really care about the surra my surroundings. I always just worked straight ahead to do what I what was in my heart to do. And I mean, horses have been my entire life and they still are. I work seven days a week still. So I've always followed my passion and that's just what I'm going to continue doing until the day God takes me home. And similarly for Diane, like pretty much the rest of you, you from a young, young girl knew that horses were where you wanted to be and then it was your connection. Absolutely. Yes. And so, Joe, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the recorded segment we just saw and just what you think has changed in the industry since you've been around the longest. <laughs> I think that I've, I'm often asked what it was like to work in a man's world in those days because it was a, very few women were at the track. As I said, there were four of us galloping backstretch. Now Graham has, I don't know how many, 15 girls galloping for him or something. I don't know what it is. But um, I always said that the, my secret was that there was, I never asked anybody in the barn to do something that I couldn't do myself. And that was the secret of being able to deal with the situation because, and even they would come to me to pull their manes and braid their manes and things like that because half of them couldn't do that. But it, that that was, I felt the secret of, of my living in a man's world. I, I never had a problem with it, I must say. I think it's very, uh, I think it's more difficult now in a way because I think they've got used to having women around and I think they treat them probably with a little less respect than they, than they did. I don't know. I don't know. And I just have a couple more here. Um, you met Michael at Pony Club. Tell us about no, how you helped Mike him. And I, Mike and I were in kindergarten school together. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about the auctions. You said you oh, would study well, them. Mike was a, was a bloodstock agent for many years. I don't know, it's so many years ago now. Um, he used to work on his catalog the minute a catalog came in for Keeman or Saratoga or Tattersalls or whatever. He'd go through and he'd spend hours picking out horses that he needed to look at for various, to fit various clients. And then I would get the, the preliminary list and go ahead of him and cut out the ones that he should go back and look at and, and, and just to, to cut his time down. So I would just pick out the ones that was worth him going back. And honestly, for a spell there, at the height of his career, I, I felt as if I was born in an auction ring. It, it, was, it was crazy. But anyway, now I've got a granddaughter doing the same thing. So she, she's, well, and having all this knowledge, I have to ask, what's the advice, if any, that you've given Graham in his illustrious training career? Oh, I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I don't advise Graham. He. Both the boys came to the horse business in spite of us, not because of us. We certainly didn't push either of them into it and uh, certainly thought there were probably better ways of making a living than the horse business. But um, I think the six years he had at Jonathan's, this is when I met Janet, um, was 
huge in his career. I mean, you know, he always says about the patience that Shepard had training horses and all the endless patience. But then you've got to have the owners who also have the patience and this and that. But I think that he learned, and a lot of people, we he's had owners who thought the less of him for being with a steeplechase trainer. But they obviously didn't know Shepard and his methods and his ways. And I think uh, I think Jonathan was a huge, huge influence in Graham's life. So wow. we, came up to, we were in Ken, we were in Lexington, Kentucky in those days, and uh, we he he came home from having a spell with Jonathan Pease in uh, in France, and we said, well, what do you want to do now? And he Mike said, well, why don't you go up to Jonathan Shepherd? I'll have a word with Jonathan. We thought one cold winter in Pennsylvania would put him off for life. We were rather hoping it would, actually. But anyway. You well, know. it turns out that Jonathan Shepherd might be the golden touch for the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, they, and it's all, the, again, the horses, right? It's all about the horses. It's all about his magic touch with the horses. I know. I know. So when you, when you think that Jonathan's had Eclipse Award winners on the flat and over jumps, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he was an amazing horseman. And, and there's absolutely no question that he was the ultimate horseman in my eyes. I don't know. I, yes. I don't think people underrate steeplechase trainers just because they haven't got to get that last inch of speed out of something or something or other. I don't know what it is, but there are people who think the less of the steeplechasing world. It, it's a pity because in, in, in England, the steeplechase is so huge and, and so um, it's not predominant, but it's, it's much more, um, what shall I say, sort of, I don't know, it's just bigger than, than it is here. And I don't think it'll ever get there here, partly because of your climate. Uh, the ground is so hard in the summer here, steeplechasing and things. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't do it year round, I don't think. Julie, well, it also doesn't appeal to the betters, which is well, you know, there you go. That's part of the issue. That's, it's because they don't, they don't see enough of it. That you know, they don't know the background, and they don't see enough of it. To, uh, one of the other things that I did that I have to put my two cents in was I actually gave Joe Aitchison a leg up on the first ride he ever had because he was working for the Adams, and he came out of the Navy, and all he wanted to do was ride stupid chasing. And um, I was at the Adams at the time, and, and I. And, and the amusing thing was that we rode a quite a difficult pig-headed mare and uh, at Belmont in those days, they didn't have rails around for the, they had just beacons around the infield there where the steeplechase course was. And uh, after about, um, I don't know, he'd gone about a mile, all of a sudden he went one side of the beacon and the horse went the other. I don't know what, quite what happened to this day, but that was his first ride. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Julie, you were going to say, make a comment about Jonathan? Oh, it's just lovely to hear them talk about Jonathan. And that is, that's so true. There was nothing, there was nothing I couldn't tell him about a horse, like from the way the horse was breathing to how I thought the horse accepted, you know, accepted the, 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 like getting tired, like how the, right. horse, how the horse felt about themselves kind of and stuff, you know? Right, right. He, he would never, not listen to me until I was completely finished, and I could tell you a lot of stuff about a horse. Yeah. <laughs> but always, it was always such a pleasure to share the most, the most detailed things and the most intimate things about a horse's breath or their personality or you know their stride, like anything. It was just yeah. you know, a subtle thing you could share with Jonathan, and it meant something to him. Right. You know, no, he's, he, I I think that. Uh... Looking back, I don't think Graham could have been in a better spot, to be honest. <laughs> but it's well, great. Fun. You can imagine the kick we get out of Graham. I mean, we've got Racetrack Network at home. We hardly miss a race. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it's great fun. We just keep our fingers crossed, won't we, for the fall, for whenever they do this, picking the... Yes, I, I think Jonathan Shepard is your, your golden ticket. But is, that's one just the, is he one of the... And Jonathan was a good sportsman and a good loser, which I think is important. Oh, yeah. I remember one time I rode this horse for him one night at the Meadowlands, and I rode this horse so bad. Oh, my God. <laughs> I busted out of gate, like, on top. I was in an outside post. I, I, we had the whole stretch to, for me to get over, get behind some horses. And I started going back, and every time I would go backwards, uh, the stream of horses would get wider, and I'd get wider out. The turn was coming up, and I was going to be like 10 wide. So I took the horse back, and I took the horse back, 
And before I know it, I, I was so out of touch with the field, and I just gave the horse way too much to do. And I just started riding for Jonathan, and I was pulling up, and I said, you just don't tell his stories. You got to tell him the truth. And he had, he had this way where he'd hold his little book like that when he was mad, and he had his book up high, and it, he was mad. <laughs> he was, he was it the whole time, what is she doing, you know, probably. And then I looked at him, and I said, that is one of the worst rides I've ever put on a horse in my life, and I'm really sorry. He was like, thank you very much. I, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Good night. Then he goes, oh. Well, he very graciously, when he presented Janet, said that he was so pleased to be presenting the second woman in the Hall of Fame. And, and he very, very graciously said that he likes to think he had an impact on your careers, but he knows that you each had an impact on his. And I really loved that. Oh. Well, there you go. They, they did that time. Oh. Yes, for sure. And I'd like to throw around one final question round Robin. I'll start with Janet. She's just gotten her light on. Janet, what Good advice night. What advice would you give your younger self? If you want to get into the business, you, you need to go and, and, you know, see some people and get, take advice from people as to who might be good to go work for, what type of horses, you know, you, you want to start out with. It, you have to, um, you know, you have to start somewhere. And, you know, if you're a youngster, you know, whether you're doing 4-H or Pony Club or any of those things, or you're going to the racetrack to hot walk or be a groom, you know, keep, keep pushing forward. But take advice. I think take advice from, from older people that can advise you which direction to go in or who they probably advise you not to go work for me. But, <laughs> but you know, I think that's, you know, a, a huge thing is to get good advice and, and like Julie, jump over the fence, make sure you get there. Love that. Uh, Julie. Um, I, I was going to say something funny, like don't sell your share of tail of the cat or something like that. <laughs> I had a share in the tail of the cat at one point. I was like, I always look back on that, and I, that was my biggest regrets I've ever had. Did but, you sell it? Yes, I did. But you, before, it was really terrible. Let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> um, but then the other part would be, what would I tell my younger self? Um, that you, I don't, I, it was crazy that you're saying this because I don't feel like I did. I I would do everything I did over again. Like I don't have anything that I look back on, and I have any thoughts or regrets about anything perfect the way it was well that must be very satisfying <laughs> diane how about you i think looking back at myself in the era that i came up i don't think i would have changed anything or could have told myself anything different other than keep on trucking just keep on following your heart your dreams and never let anybody deter you so i don't so think i you know, maybe if I came along 25 years later, I would have a different way of thinking. But to come in my error, I I don't think there's anything else I could change. Yeah, I, I, I feel very much the same about that. And I also think that you need to start right at the bottom and, and so that you can do it all. <laughs> I, that's that one thing I definitely did, start at the bottom. <laughs> yes, well, so did I. But uh, it, 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 I think that that's the most important. As I said, I, I know that half my success with the fellows in, in the, when I was at Belmont was because I, I could never had to ask them to do something I couldn't do myself because I'd done it already, you know, and I think it's important because they're not going to take it from a woman if they think that she can't do it herself. They, might, they may not consciously have that thought, but I, I, I think that's one of the things. Yeah. 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 But I, th I think that it's very, um, I don't think there's much I would have changed in my life. It's been crazy, really, but but uh, I don't know. You know, the last 30 years, I've had the shot, and that's been quite an experience. We lost you there. Oh, you've lost me now? Ooh. Oh, that was me. I think you lost me a little bit. But yes, well, oh. we'll, be, we'll be crossing all fingers and toes for Absolutely. that Hall of Fame ballot. Got to do that. And cheers to Graham. I, I will say gladly here, I'd love to, to
to plug Joe Motion as a mother. She has raised two of the finest gentlemen, nicest <laughs> gentlemen I've ever met, uh, for sure. Yeah. And I'd love to know from Janet and Julie, our two Hall of Famers, what do you see happening in the future just with who's up and coming? Do you see anyone making it? Who's going to be next? Oh, um, yeah. Some girl jockeys right now there's like five apprentice girl jockeys that i'm so excited about like two of them are in florida uh one's at uh, both both of the florida tracks right like um one's at golf stream and they've all been winning so it's like so fun to see them all like um and it it was it was the most it's it's the most exciting thing lately i've been calling them all i'm friends with all of them on facebook and i talk talk to them and chat to them and and i'm like where are you going next what are you doing and so i'm really but all the young girl jockeys that are coming around right now. So the young girl, sorry, the, Julie. The Apprentice Award. That was pretty cool. Oh, the, yes. Yeah. Yes. And Janet? There's a young girl jockey who is now riding down at Tampa. Yes. Who was at Fair Hill uh, working. Well, her, her father was involved with steeplechasing. Tyler? Maddie or Rowland? Gage, the girl Gage. I, I'm talking about Maddie Rowland, uh, her father. Huh? Mark, you know, worked, yeah, was at Fairhill. Sadly, he is not with us any longer. But um, she has, she went down to Florida and everybody started saying initially, well, she shouldn't go to Florida because nobody knows her down there. She'll never get any rides. And she's doing extremely well. She had her first double about four or five days ago. Yep. So it's, it's, you know, it's pretty exciting. She's a little tiny bit of a thing. <laughs> But she, again, her background initially was involving being involved with steeplechasing. What well, about training, yeah. Janet? What about training? Women training? Yes, it's just you know, been there's nobody like you, of course. Well, there's plenty, <laughs> plenty better than me. I mean, you know, well, look at first Lizzie Merriman. You know, she has done very well she not only has she done well training for other people but she d has done very well training for herself she went uh that mayor and and uh no she's done well now there's I, there are more and more women training now than there were that's for sure yes uh, and cheers to the trailblazers um and i always love to talk about max hirsch's daughter mary hirsch who was the first to take out a license many will say Max got her through the red tape, being a, you know, triple crown winning trainer. But and he was the primary trainer for the King Ranch uh, in the 30s. So he got her a lot of good horses and she wasn't really allowed to be the trainer on paper for a little while. And she was tabled in New York, but went to other states. But I like to think of her because she won the Travers. She won the Diana. She won the Travers. Um, she ran a horse in the Derby, Diane, in I think 19, oh, it was War Admiral. She had to run against War Admiral, so that didn't go well for her. But, um, but she, you know, kind of started paving the way, way back when. So I think, Janet, this might just be a testament to, to how great you are with, with your horses that, that you're the one who's in after all these years. Well, thank you. I thought, I thought Judy Johnson was the first to hold a license, a flat license. She, well, Mary got one, but she had to get it through some. I think Judy Johnson was the first to get a license. As a trainer. Way, way back. Way back in the days that I remember. <laughs> we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to check that one. Well, thank you all so much. This has been so special, beyond special, getting such a stellar group together. It's definitely rare that we get to have you all at once, so. I liked it too. It was fun chatting with everybody. I felt like I just had a nice supper. <laughs> it, it has it has been fun. It's been great. It definitely is, and and you're all very humble, but you're all very extraordinary. So we we salute you, and we will be looking for those next up and comers. And we thank Katie and Carrie for the work they're doing and the openness that they're showing um, after spending you know their whole lives on the thoroughbred industry side. They're really trying to to make it a really, you know, embracing open place 
for more people to get involved, which I think we'd all agree is exactly what we need. So we will send everyone along. Happy trails. Exactly. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you all for joining us. You can follow Streamhorse TV on social and the replay will be available of this show. We will just add our special thanks here quickly. For all of our promotional partners, we can't thank you enough. We really appreciate everyone and especially our wonderful, wonderful trailblazers. Everyone have a great night and happy trails. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.